next time lecture for the 9 o'clock slot is Dr. Spencer Furby. You wouldn't know he's a doctor by looking in his office, but he is a doctor. He grew up in Frederictown, Missouri, and attended the Flat River Church of Christ, where CRC's Paul McFadden and Tim Walter were recruiting in the 1980s. Back that far. He attended CRC from 1990 to 1992 before moving on to Free Hardman and Harding Graduate School to pursue Bible degrees. He married Melissa Reddick of Paragould after meeting her at the Burger King while studying Greek flashcards. For Mr. Hale's class, they have two kids, Noah and Abby, and are members of the Valley View Church of Christ, where Furby has preached since 2016. And I have the privilege of shadowing him as an apprentice. So let's start with a word of prayer and the message will come. Lecture to us. God, we are so grateful today. We're so thankful for you and, and for your heart and your character. And we just pray that you would uh, refine us today uh, for Spencer. We pray you speak for Spencer. Give him the courage and the wisdom to uh, preach boldly to us today. We ask him for open hearts and open minds uh, to not only your word, but also your will for our lives. Thank you for Jesus and the hope that we have in him. In his name we pray. Amen. for being here and thank you for supporting Curley's Ridge uh, College. Um, as he mentioned, I was uh, here previously back in the 1900s and um, enjoyed my time here. And uh, I, I'll say this, Todd will, once will ask questions, which are good questions. It'll say, uh, what, what still makes you nervous? Funerals don't make me much nervous. I hate weddings, uh, but I, I, I'm okay with funerals. Preaching, I'm I'm okay with. It's lectures that kill me. Uh, it's coming back to CRC, and I don't know if it's because of uh, the people you know who will be there, or if it's because of the significance of your alma mater, and you're wanting to uh, do your best to represent well what they did for you. I don't know what it is, but I, I feel terrified every time I come here, and I, I still haven't put my finger on that. But anyway, we're I was given this topic and they didn't say anything about it, just take the legacy of John and do something with it. And uh, I began to think about uh, what, what John means to me, maybe. Maybe what, what his legacy has done in my life and the lives of people I know. So this morning we're going to go a little bit on a treasure hunt. We're in pursuit of our inheritance. Uh, something that's been left behind from the past from someone else that we can glean from and makes us better people. We've been bequeathed something very special. And we need to know what it is so we can take advantage of it. And we'll phrase it in the form of a question. It's this, what is, what really is the legacy of John the Apostle? What did he leave behind that we really desperately need to have? It makes us something different. To determine that, we need a little bit of a definition. And so I looked everywhere for a definition, and here's one on uh, just some website. Okay, I don't even know where it was. But they were arguing that we misuse the word, kind of like effect, affect, which I still don't know the difference. But, but there is still these two words, legacy and history. Be sure to use them properly. This website was making an argument for it. So here is what legacy means, according to them. Something handed down from the past, often with a positive connotation. So it's history back there. It's something that took place back there in time. You've got to go back and retrieve it. But, but it still has an impact even today on other people. And, and they're saying it's positive. But I can, I can, you, you know as well as I do that, neg that legacy is negative too. So you think about, let me just throw out a couple names, like Ahab and Jezebel. I mean, does that bring up uh, bad things? Like These are two people who together led God's people into something ungodly and really promoted godlessness among God's people? Are there people who still do that today, trying to lead people into false religion? Absolutely, that legacy is still here. Demas is another one I think of. Uh, that he was working with Paul, he's a great missionary, but suddenly the world got too big in his eyes and he decided, I want to go after the world. Are there people who were, you once had the faith who fall in love with the world again and go back into the world? There's plenty of those. That legacy is still around. But most often we think of this in a positive connotation, and so that's what we're going to do today. Go back in the past and find something that has something of positive power for us. 
Well, what specifically might that be? And it offers three uh, suggestions. Uh, and I, I want to see what John has to say about each one of these, or has to, to do with each one of these. It could be a physical object from the past. It could be a tradition. It could be a set of values passed down from one generation to another. When I think of physical things, I've been to Washington, D.C., and I've seen this. Anybody know what this is? Spirit of St. Louis? It's the, 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 the huge Charles Lindbergh flight. And so I think that's fascinating. I go back and you go to museums, and people actually go to museums, right? And the reason they go is something about these things, these physical things, triggers the significance of something in the past that still today blesses us. If you ever get on an airplane to go somewhere, these were the forebears of this, this kind of flight right here. And it, it gives you, a, it triggers something. This is a copy, uh, this is the Constitution in Washington, D.C., the actual original. I've seen it, walked by it, and people walk by it, and they stand for hours to, to see this thing. It has some amazing legacy for us. You might have something like this in your home. You might have something from, uh, from a, a loved one in the past who's no longer around, but it triggers in you the significance of their legacy in your life. It might be your mom's ring, it might be a vase from somewhere, it might be your dad's old harmonica, whatever it is. It's legacy, it triggers something that's valuable to you. And there's a connection. What about tradition? This summer, you're gonna be watching the Olympics, at least some of us will. We're watching the Olympics, which is this tradition that's been going on, not totally, for not totally consistently, but since 3,000 years ago with the Greeks, right? So this is a huge tradition over time, and we're connecting back with the past when we see people compete in the Olympics. There might be other things like this, these traditions. Back in my hometown of Fredertown, where Tim and Paul came, Flat River, came out with my hand-knit tie at that time. That was, the that, that was a fad back then. It was already over, but I was still using it. But it's the Azalea Festival every year in April. There's the Azalea Festival, and anybody who's anybody from Fredertown comes back for the Azalea Festival. Here's another tradition. Anybody aware of this one? You'll notice the numbers on it, 1964, which means this year is math majors, 60 years. And I'm figuring you're here because somehow or another, Harding's had some kind of bear, uh, Harding's, yeah, I just messed up, right? I'm looking at Harding over here. The Coley's Ridge College has had some kind of bearing on you, something that, that has come out of here, something you experienced here stays with you. And even when you leave here, it's still with you. It's called legacy, and it shapes who you are. I know one family, in fact, they're here. This family's a little weird, at least some of them are. They, they, they will every year go to a campsite. They'll all get campers, and they'll all, their families from everywhere will go to this camp, and they'll just camp out for several days together as a family, just reconnect. And there's some people who used to be in that camp out that are no longer around. It's a legacy. It's a tradition for their family. It's a ritual, and it helps to define who they are, and it's still very much important to them, and probably will be for years. Then I think about another thing, a way of life. This is another way to pass along a legacy. I hope Christianity is a way of life for you. I hope it's not just a legacy, but I hope it is a legacy. It would be cool if, if, if for you, if you have a heritage that's passed down to you, and then you pass it down to the next generation, it becomes this legacy. And people want to be Christians, and you, I've got to tell you this, part of the reason I can't give up my Christian faith, part of it, not the whole thing, is I couldn't disappoint that grandmother of mine who gave it to me in the first place. That legacy is hugely important to me. The history and the glue, it becomes the emotional glue for me. This group of people, this is a nomad, but I, I'm reminded of a, of a story in Jeremiah of the Rechabites. You know, they had this forefather from 200 years before that, uh, Jehonadab, who decided for his family in the days of Jehu, that's way back there, 200 years before, we are not going to drink alcohol. As a family, we're not going to drink alcohol, we're not going to live in homes. We're going to live in tents. We're going to be nomads, be up and leave and go to different places at any moment. So they decided that. 200 years later in the days of Jeremiah, they're still living this way for the same reason, because our forefather set this standard for us. And God commends that. And he says through Jeremiah in this sermon, it becomes a sermon illustration. You see those people? 
their forefathers set up a way of life they still honor today. Why can't I do that with you? Why can't this legacy matter to you? You've been handed this faith. I want you to pass it on to other people. That's legacy. So what I want to do is trace John the Apostle. What is the legacy that we have from him? What difference does he make in your 2024 life? Legacy of John. One of them is rather easy. The first one, we don't have like this physical item, but it's his literature, right? It's the words he left behind. It's something one day he decided, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, he put pen to papyrus, right? And he started writing down the story of Jesus. Now, he already knew that there were other stories written. He's writing sometime probably in the 80s, right? And the other Gospels are already floating around. He already knows what they say. But he says, I'm going to write my own story. I want to write my version of it. And it's not that it's different. It's just that he wants to write from a particular bit. Remember what he says in, maybe, I may have just messed this up. All right, I'm going to go the old-fashioned way and look it up. If you have your Bibles, we can turn to John chapter 20. John chapter 20. When he decides to write his, after the others are already present, he says this. There's many other things, right? Jesus did many other things. This is John chapter 20, verse 30. Now, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. Some of them are written in other books. Some of them are already written in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. But I'm going to write these things down. He says, but these are written so you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, that by believing, you can have life in his name. I saw these things, John said. And in fact, as I review his entire life and ministry, I, I picked seven things, the seven signs of John. I picked seven things that are most important to me in coming to the conclusion that Jesus really was the Christ. There's any number of other things. In fact, the last of the verse of the book of John is that there are many other things. I could have filled the earth. These things are enough. I'm going to remember with you and for you. I'm going to write it down by the power of the Holy Spirit. He writes this in a letter, and he writes it down, and we have it. We have it. God has seen in his wisdom to make sure that even years later, it's in our Bibles that we use to shape and inform our faith. Aren't you thankful John wrote down what most made him convinced Jesus is the Christ? And he says, you don't even have to have seen this yourself. That's more First John. We'll get there in a minute. You don't even have to see it yourself. I'm telling you, I saw it. I touched him. I saw him. I heard him. I wrote this down. And this is going to be enough for you, too, to have life. We've never saw, we've never seen Jesus ourselves. But the writings are enough. With the Holy Spirit's testimony, the words of these eyewitnesses, it's enough. John left behind his eyewitness account of the life of Jesus in the early church. The gospel was written at a, at a later time. He has so many different unique insights that the others don't reveal. He has so many different perspectives than the others. And then he writes in 1 John. Let's see if this will work. It's not, yeah, okay, here we go. That which is from the beginning, which we've heard, which we've seen with our eyes, which you've looked upon, our hands have touched, concerning the word of life. The life was made manifest. We've seen it. We testify to it. We proclaim to you the eternal. You get his point over and over again. He's stressing this, which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. That which we have seen and heard, we're proclaiming to you so that you too may have fellowship with us and our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. Is it possible for people today to have as intimate a fellowship with the Father as John himself did. Yes, it is. But it's going to take an eyewitness testimony. And looky here. We got it. That's just one of them. You've also got other eyewitnesses, okay, eyewitness account. But John is saying to us, you have what you need to have a, 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 a relationship, a fellowship with each other and with the God the Father who sent Jesus to be the Savior. 
These are things that he leaves behind. He wants us to have a record of it, and he made sure to provide it, and it's one of the commissions he was given. It's not only 1 John, 2 John. He's saying different things in 2 John. These are when he's trying to apply this to the lives of people at the end of the first century. This is a few years later from the gospel. Not long. And now I ask you, dear lady, not as though I'm writing you a new command, but the one that we've had from the beginning, that we should love one another. And this is love, that we walk according to his commandments. It needs to affect your life. And these early, these churches, even at the end of the first century, were already being intimidated by false teaching. They were already being challenged by faulty views of the gospel. And John is saying, I'm going to make sure you know I've got my gospel and I'm, I'm going to keep writing to you. And so he does Second John. He does Third John the same way. And then I'm going to add this. This is at no extra cost. He wrote Revelation 2. This one... This one is strange. You can't do it. You can't add this in with these others and have a lectureship. It would just be too complicated. But this John wrote Revelation, and here's what he's saying. Everybody wants to, 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 to kind of shorten Revelation. Let's say this. It's not just that we won. The thing about Revelation is God wins. The question is, are you on his side? It's the question of Revelation. Because when he goes through the letters of the churches, he's saying, guys, you're, you're looking awful lot like the world. You're assimilating into the world, and if you do that, you will not be on the victor team. Not because God doesn't win, but because you're not with God. And Revelation is do not assimilate with the world. And if you look at the church today, the number one threat to us is looking too much like the world. Assimilating into the world, it just, it just looks the same. When they come off the street into our church buildings, everything looks the same, and it ought not to. It ought not to. We should unapologetically, when they come in from the church, from the street to the church, something should be very, very different here. And that's what Revelation is. And that's what John gives us. As for the gospel, it's the more spiritual gospel, Clement said. And he points out a lot of things that maybe the other ones didn't. And I think maybe because he was impressed by different things or because years later he reflects and some of those things came out that he that uh, that mattered more later than even than he thought. Um, for those who have not uh, been impacted by it, um, I can't imagine anyone being a Christian today that doesn't have John 3.16 in their head. Is there anybody here who doesn't, doesn't think about that? And then you go to 1 John 3.16, he tells you how to apply that. You've got the stuff of the passion of John in John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word. You don't get that with the others. You get this rich thing of how he connects him to God in the beginning. The obvious concern for the balance of love and truth. He wants both. He wants to acknowledge both of those. The longing for the church to be able to resist assimilation with the world. All that stuff is happening in these books. But that's not all. There's other things to this too. Here's the second legacy of John. Other than the literature, which is amazingly rich, you've got this tradition of what does it mean to be a fisher of men? The mission of John. That's what he was called by Christ in the first place. I want, I want you to follow me, and that means like 24-7. I want you to follow my way of life, and then I want to teach you to be fishers of men. So follow me, and I'm going to make you that. And we know the qualifications of this. In order to be an apostle, you had to watch Jesus from the day he started ministry on, and then definitely to see the resurrected Christ. And then we have from John, only John, John chapters 14 through 16. The Holy Spirit's going to be sent, and he's going to empower you to remember everything I did, everything I said. He's going to teach you extra things so that you can bridge the gap between Jesus and the flesh and those coming after. You don't see this. You're going to be a bridge. The Spirit's going to help you. And then that powerful, high priestly prayer of John 17, where Jesus prays for the disciples, and it's through their words that we are going to come. We can't be believers without the words of those disciples and eyewitnesses. And we have the same task they did. We've lost this a little bit. I myself have. I see this in the church. We, our fundamental mission, according to John and according to the apostles, is this. Share the gospel with the world that they might have life. And if we don't have this same mission, we won't have a church. It is who we are. It's what we're supposed to be doing. 
But my favorite part, if you were to ask what the favorite legacy is, you're going to have to picture some scrapbook stuff. We're going to have to go in pursuit of some scrapbook photos of John. Because while I love his literature, and it's absolutely essential for our faith, and I love the fact of his mission, of he was one who spanned that bridge so that we could have access to that firsthand information of Jesus. It's the person of John that most impacts my life. This is not a, a photo from uh, back then, obviously. This is from The Chosen, you know this. I'm going to try to give you some photos from back then. But we're going to start in his childhood. John was the son of Zebedee, of course. His brother was James. And uh, they were pretty well off. They owned a, a fishing business. They owned the boats. They had servants, we're told. He was Jewish. He was from Galilee, kind of backwater, according to the people of Jerusalem. Uh, but he was most likely, we can assume, that he disliked Roman rule. He didn't like Samaritans. He was considered kind of redneck compared to the people of Jerusalem. Being a little more prosperous, owning their own business, probably gave them a sense of uh, entitlement, maybe. That's just something to look for. It's not something to assume. These traits you start looking for, what is it about John that we know? And most of it is not from John that we know this. Most of it is from the Synoptic Gospels. We see a photo. Here's a photo, actual photo taken from the calling of John uh, with the apostles uh, as an apostle from Jesus. And there they are. It's all four at the same time being called, right? And then we see a group photo. Um, and that's all right. It's a group photo in the scrapbook. On the back of it, Mark, Mark makes some notes. These are his handwritten, handwritten notes. And he says, these are the twelve. Simon, to whom he gave the name Peter, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, the brother of James, to whom he gave the name Boanerges, sons of thunder. No explanation for that. Mark just puts it in there. It's on the back of the photo. You can take it out of the book. Andrew, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, and Thomas, James, son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, Simon, the Zealot, Judas, Iscariot, and betrayed him. So there's a picture, and then he gives a certain note. Why was, why, was, why was James and John, why were James and John called? Sons of Thunder. We have no idea. That's just how Mark put it. But these three, uh, Peter, James, and John, ended up becoming kind of like a inner three, right? And we see some photos of their uh, experiences that they got apart from the others. So you might recognize this as the transfiguration. You got Moses and Elijah up there, of course. And then you got the three. Those three inner people. They got to see some stuff that the others didn't. These are little clues about their experiences. Here's another one. This is from the raising of Jairus' daughter. He goes into the room where the, the, the daughter is dead, and the parents go with him, and he only allows three. Why? I, I don't know. It just says they got three. And it's interesting, after these events, they always argue who's the greatest. I have to think they're going, oh, you picked me. Look at this. He picked me. And it starts feeding that sense of, I don't know, superiority or something. Then you've got in the garden. There's Jesus and you've got those three falling asleep. All of them were there but a little further he took the three and then a little further himself and they're all here and then you've got Peter and, and, and John. They're, they're preparing the Passover meal and they're running to the empty tomb. The, these guys are just somehow different they're, but they're treated a little different by Jesus and so that goes into your understanding who John was. It's important to get that. But there's three particular instances we need photos from. The first one we don't have a photo from. I couldn't find anybody who tried to, to get the photo. John said to him, this is the only speaking part John had when he wasn't with somebody. It was him and Jesus here. Jesus said to him, teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name. Mark chapter 9. And we tried to stop him because he was not following us. But Jesus said, do not stop him, for no one who does a mighty work in my name will soon afterward be able to speak evil of me. For the one who is not against us is for us, and truly I say to you, whoever gets you a cup of water to drink because you belong to Christ will by no means lose his reward. John thought he was protecting the integrity of the group. John thought, I have to, I have to say, you know, you're not in this group. You're an outsider. I'm going to stop you from doing something you were doing. But he was doing it. Now, I'm all sorts of confused about this passage, and just when I think I have a grasp, I get confused again. So I'm not really sure what this means. 
But what I do know is that John seems to want to defend and protect the exclusivity of an inner group. He wants to make sure that this other person is stopped. And you want to say, they couldn't do this if they weren't right with God. But according to the Sermon on the Mount, that's not true. Many will say to him, Lord, Lord, have we not done some of these things? But Jesus doesn't even know them. That's a confusion. But Jesus has a right to say what he wants to. We don't. Now, I'm going to tell you, this is humbling to me. And this rebuke he gets here, um, I don't, it might call it a slight rebuke. He's going to get a rougher rebuke here in just a minute. This is a slight rebuke and a correction. You don't have to be the guard dog for the brotherhood. You don't have to define things. If, if I started Valley View Church of Christ on my way down here, I would pass three hospitals that are very central to this area. One of them is Catholic, one of them is Methodist, and one of them is Baptist. And in the name of Christ, they're doing some amazing things. I don't have to stop and try to correct their theology. Any time, I don't have to do that. I don't have to do. Jesus is going to take care of that in the end. I, I need to act with some humility and just be grateful that there's people in the name of Jesus doing some amazing things. And I have been a beneficiary of those things. And I don't know how to understand this. Someone's going to come up afterwards and explain it to me. And if you want to, that's okay. But once you do, I'm still going to be confused, I promise, because I think I'm supposed to be. I think this is supposed to be confusing. So this is one of those moments, one of the moments when John speaks on his own, nobody's around. Scene number two, does that remind you of anything? There's the photo. I'm going to put the words up here in a minute. Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem now, where he's going to secure our salvation. And he goes through the Samaritan village, and the people don't give Jesus a real warm reception. Kind of harsh toward him. And when his disciples, James and John, saw it, they said, John was in on this, Lord, do you want us to tell fire to come down from heaven and consume them? We're going to have a bonfire, a Samaritan bonfire. Because they have rejected you. They've just, in this one moment, they've decided they don't like you at this moment, so let's burn the house down. Let's call on our inner Elijah and go prophetic. He turned and he rebuked them. That's all it really says. He just turned, nodded his head, and just let them know this is out of bounds. What does this tell you about him? What does this tell you about these brothers? It, it, it may be too unfair to draw too much from this because, I mean, if we, any one of us takes an instant photo of something we've done that we just was really not in our best moment, and blew it up and said, this is all of us, none of us wants to do this. But this says something about John here. He kind of has a temper. He can be explosive. Is this where Sons of Thunder came from? That's what most people think. It makes sense. You ready to say, if people aren't ready to respond to Jesus when we think they should be ready, let's just fire them up. Scene number three. I just, I'll tell you. I'll just tell you the story because it's too many words on it, but to put on screen. Uh, I, the, the photo I like the best is Jesus is having a conversation um, with the disciples, and the mother comes up. Uh, and you know this. James and John's mother come up to ask him, and they're peeking around a tree in the back because they're ashamed that their mom's going to do this. I don't know if that's true because Matthew says the mother does it, but Mark says they do it. So I don't know who does it, but you know what they do, right? Come up to Jesus and they say, we want you to do for us what we want you to do. And Jesus, of course, as any parent or person would do, well, I need to know what you want first. Give us the places of honor. Let one of us sit on your right your left in your glory. We want to be right there, your right and left hand. We want seats of honor. This sounds like a spoiled brat fisherman Right? A person who grew up having some advantages over other people because his dad was the business owner, and so they feel a sense of entitlement. And Jesus responds with a couple of things. First of all, are you going to be able to be baptized with the baptism I'm baptized with? Are you going to be willing to suffer? Because to get those places, you're going to have to suffer. And they say, we will. And Jesus says, yeah, bet you will. And then he says, kingdom greatness is different than anything that you've seen in this world. Kingdom greatness, how you earn greatness, 
the credibility in the kingdom, the capital in the economy of the kingdom is not prestige and public acclaim. It is selfless service. That's how you get greatness in the kingdom. And, and once again, they are just kind of reprimanded, right? They just kind of said, well, I'm correcting you. John MacArthur wrote uh, 12 Ordinary Men, and this is what he writes about these three things. He puts them together. He says, it is clear from the gospel accounts, I'll let him say if you don't like it, blame John MacArthur, that John was capable of behaving in the most sectarian, narrow-minded, unbending, reckless, impetuous fashion. He was followable. He was brash. He was aggressive, passionate, zealous, and personally ambitious. Is that too much to draw from these three scenes that we looked at? Maybe. Maybe not. Did he feel spiritually smug and righteous enough to justify judging other people? And he had the right to dish out a sentence of death on him? Did he feel from childhood prosperity that he deserved seats of dignity? Did he find the good works of people outside his circle to be lacking in value because they weren't one of the ends crowd? That's the image I get in my head, and maybe that's where Sons of Thunder came from. My snapshots make a picture like this. But that sets up the baseline, and that's what I'm saying about his legacy is this is where he was. Remember the Gospels, Synoptic Gospels, written in, the, written in the 60s, looking back on the 30s. It's now past some time, and, then, and they're, they're reporting everything that happened, and yet then you get the book of Acts a little bit later, right? Just a little bit later, and you, you see in the story of Acts that um, it opens up and there's Peter and John. Peter is second fiddle. I mean, John is second fiddle to Peter, right? He's willing to work with this guy. He doesn't need all the press. And they're the first people to get beaten for the faith and imprisoned for the faith and having to defend the faith. And they're, they're looking at these two and they're unschooled people. And yet they may have the, the courage and the depth of integrity and the ability to stand with conviction. These guys have been with Jesus. It's an amazing thing. And then they're beaten again, and then they go and they pray for boldness. That's where John is in the book of Acts, after the Spirit falls on them. And then it wasn't long after that, his brother dies and he suffers. The death of a brother would be suffering, part of it. And then you have the movement. John chapter, or Acts chapter 1, verse 8, you go from Jerusalem and you go to Samaria. And who is it that goes to oversee the Samaritan expansion of the kingdom of God, the gospel going out? It's Peter and John. The very one who was one to fry Samaritans before is now going to oversee that they get the gospel and come to life. That has to change. That racism has been challenged. And it's no longer present. You see the difference. It would be a little while before John adds his own account of the life of Jesus, and it contains a different approach, clearly going for, for the minimal approach, trying to get just enough for you to understand this guy is really something special. Notice a couple of things about the gospel. He never even mentions his own name. The guy who wanted to make a name for himself to be the right hand of Jesus now says, I don't even care if my name is in the record at all. And every time his name is supposed to appear, we just hear Jesus' name again, the disciple whom Jesus loved. Let's give Jesus as much press as we can. Every time John enters, Jesus is there. What's he saying as he writes the story? This is about Jesus, and he changed everything for me, and I don't even care if my name is in the record, even though he wrote it, that's what we know. He's the only one to record the Samaritan woman. Why do you think that impressed him to make it one of the few things he put in there? Is it because he wanted to fry some of those Samaritans before? And he sees Jesus taking the time when nobody else would. And that so touched him that the other three didn't even put it in. And John says, I'm going to have to put it in there. Right smack dab, chapter 4. It wasn't chapter 4 to him, but it is to us. And while he wants to silence everybody who's not in the in crowd, now in John chapter, in, in John the gospel, he says, God so loved the entire world. He gave his only begotten son. 
And then right after that, he said, Jesus didn't come into the world to condemn the world, but to save it. He's gotten the message. He's been with Jesus long enough that his entire life is being transformed. He's a different person than he was 30 years ago. That's the legacy of John. And that's what we need more than anything else to use his literature and use his mission to change our own lives and become different people. And when the world sees it, the only explanation for it is a living God back behind that story. That's the legacy of John. And he keeps going, doesn't he? He still is about truth. John chapter 6 records Jesus telling that tough truth. He's the only one to record it. And, and then all those disciples just go away. So many of those followers go away, but he tells that tough truth, and we've got to stick with that tough truth. And even when you get the first and second and third John, these, these the messages of love, yes, love, but truth has to be there, because without truth, love is powerless. And he's telling us that over and over again. The raising of Lazarus, the people saying, look at how Jesus loved him. He wanted to make sure people knew Jesus loved people, and that's the three-pronged thing when he says, a new commandment I give you, you love one another. And he's the one that records the whole conversation at, at, at that time, right? At the, at, the, at the washing of feet. When Jesus says, this is how the world will know that you love me, by defending my doctrine and fighting over it. No, it's by loving each other that the world will know you are my disciples. Where did John get this when he was so willing to be divisive before? He's been changed. He was called by Jesus. You wouldn't budge on Jesus either. First, second, third John. You change Jesus if you alter him, if he's not human, if he's not Christ in the flesh, you, you are to be removed. He has not gone light. He's still got his robust zeal. He's still got his the absolute truth that you have to stand on. But it, even so, you still have to love each other and serve each other with the world's needs. Human needs. He wanted to be close to Jesus on the night of the betrayal. So he, the last supper, there he was, right by Jesus. This man is different. He's different at the end than he was at the beginning. And I have this expectation for those who've been Christians longer and longest. There should be something different. There should be something different. It should be, that's the legacy of John, isn't it? We don't know any of the other apostles as long as we know John. John had such a long, longitudinal stu uh, study, we could say, a longitudinal study of this guy. And, and just notice the change as it keeps going, as it keeps going. He longed for people to come to eternal life. He wanted everybody. He'd tell everybody. And that transformation came. And so the tradition says that as he got older in Ephesus, they would carry him to the meeting place. And he would just, they'd take him to the front of the auditorium. I don't know if they even had auditorium, whatever. They, my children, my little children love one another. And that was the common thing. He just constantly said that every, every time. And then someone would say, according to tradition, allegedly, they would say, why is that all you'll say? It's the commandment of the Lord, and if it only be done, it's all sufficient. So we witness this third legacy, his transformation. From son of thunder to the apostle of love. And the question I have, the one that the preacher wants to know, not the lecturer, the preacher wants to know, how did it happen? Well, that's kind of what the Gospel of John is. An explanation of how that happened. He followed Jesus. He wasn't a Christian. He didn't believe in Jesus. He followed Jesus. He kept doing what Jesus did. He kept saying what Jesus said. Now, specifically, what does that mean? When he was rebuked, he learned from it. He changed. We know of at least two times he was rebuked by Jesus, and I'll bet you there's a lot of unrecorded if you were in my life for very long, I would get daily rebukes, I'm pretty sure, right? It's these things. And in fact, we're told from Paul and Timothy, the Word of God is for rebuke. And every time you read it, 
If you read it and you're not rebuked, you're not paying attention and you're not doing a transformative reading because it, it just penetrates in the dividing of the heart and soul, right? It, the joints and the marrow and it's living and it's active and it, 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 it cuts between just words and your intents, right? Intentions. Are you ever rebuked? Can God still rebuke you? Can you still be corrected by the word? And you go, oh, that, yeah, I've got to change something, but I'm not changing my commitment to God. I'm changing myself, and I'm conforming to this. Can he still rebuke you? And can the church still do this? Are we so on eggshells that when we see someone, and the whole point of the church is we're helping each other be holy, and someone needs to be rebuked, and they're not listening to Scripture, can the church have the integrity to go and rebuke lovingly someone? And will they listen? Will you listen? John was rebuked, and we saw it. We had a front row seat to some very harsh things. And apparently... He backed up and he considered it. And he changed. We get to see by the end just how real the change was. When he was allowed close access, he took advantage. Jesus let him in close. I don't know if they were by invitation because they were three, you know, they were a teacher's pet, or were they or, or, were they so eager and he saw that they were gonna be useful? Or did Jesus just say, hey, if you want to go with me, you can? I don't know what the answer to that is. But when Jesus invited him in close, he came. He went. He did whatever he could. Hey, go prepare that Passover meal. He and Peter take off. And when he rises from the dead, I don't know why there aren't 11 people at that grave. I want to see that. There's two people for sure, Peter and John. When you have a chance to be close... Go close. If you're not close, it's a choice you're making, not that he's making. And John went close. And when it was time for the Last Supper, he said, get away from me, y'all. I'm getting right on it. I'm going to hear every whisper. Get close. When he heard our teaching, he internalized it and he obeyed. John issued some hard teaching to people. The Gospels are full of it, like uh, that the world walks at, and even we do too. Love your enemies. Pray for those who despitefully use you and persecute you. There's so many things in there that are hard, and we end up debating this. What to do with our wealth. How to control our greed and materialism. There's so much about that in Scripture that we often just kind of, well, yeah, like it's. When you hear hard teaching, rather than dismiss it or argue it away or find some commentary to tell you why it doesn't mean what it really said, consider the best hermeneutic there is. Do it. Do it and see what happens because it ends up being like John. One more. When he was called upon, he was willing to suffer. Now, he doesn't die like the others, apparently. Tradition says, well, there's one tradition that says he was boiled in oil, but it didn't do anything to him. But he was exiled to Patmos for a while, and out of that come the book of Revelation. I mean, it, they, they, they did some things to him. He suffered different things in his life. And what I understand from Scripture is, it's not if we're going to suffer. It's when we suffer. And we're living in a world right now where if you're not suffering, you're not really standing for the truth that John knew. Because if you do, this world's going to lash out at you. And you need to be ready. And you need to be willing. And when you do all this, when, when you do these things, it transforms you. Each one of these, you might not even register. It may not... Not, may, not, not something that you recognize immediately, but every time, and I tell young people this all the time, every time you do what God wants you to do rather than what you want to do, you're changed. In just little degrees, from one degree to another, you're changed, you're transformed. And that's what happened to John. And that's his greatest legacy. And I'm telling you, I'm telling you, the legacy of John is this. He left behind his record of the life of Christ that he saw firsthand, that he knew this is powerful enough to transform your life.
He shared it with other people. He became a fisher of men. And he went and he shared it with generations of people that have since then just passed it on to us. And we're several generations removed, but it's the same faith. And then he gives us this example of a life completely transformed by following Jesus. And maybe the way we live our lives, maybe the truth is we are a legacy of John. I hope, and I look out here and I see some people I know, you look an awful lot like him. You look Johnish. That's the greatest legacy of all. Let's, let's pray together. Father, we are grateful for your truth. We're grateful for the power of your word. We're grateful for eyewitnesses. We know they saw you. We know John saw you. In your son we know that he witnessed and heard the words we know that his life was completely totally radically changed by what he saw and heard and we know father by your holy spirit that he wrote those things down and you made sure that we were able to get those words and we're assured that those same words can do the same for us transform us like it did john we believe in that word. We want to share that word with the lost world. And we want our lives to be transformed so the world can know what a community of transformed people in the love of Christ looks like. And I pray, Father, that we will carry on your legacy and that we'll pass it on to the next generation and to the next generation until we finally meet you face to face. We look forward to that. And until then, Father, keep transforming us. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.